this is unit one, uh, writing assignment, the very first one. The, the idea here is to take Roman numerals and figures and turn them into, first of all, outer voice counterpoint, and then full chords, four parts. Uh, as a first step, let's take these Roman numerals and figures and create a bass line. We're in G major, and if we remember what Roman numeral and figure goes with what bass note, we're going to go really fast. We've already talked about dominant sevenths and their inversions, what scale degree, what scale degree goes in the bass for each one. We also need to know about these two chords, ones and one sixes, because that's the other thing going on in here. Those are very quick and easy. Of course, if you've got a one, a Roman numeral one, you've got scale degree one as your bass note. With one six, that's first inversion. You might have learned it that way. That means we're going to have scale degree three in the bass. So let's, let's just sketch out some notes here. If I know my 543 goes with scale degree 2, I'll just automatically get that scale degree 2 up there and not have to exert a bunch of mental energy to make that happen. 565, five, scale degree 7 is in the bass. Now that makes sense because that's my leading tone. It has to resolve the scale degree 1. There's scale degree one. Of course, the Roman numerals give us that. Five, four, two. Do you remember the scale degree that goes in the bass for that one? Scale degree four. And we resolve it. And there we go. Five, gosh, which octave? I guess this one. I could have just as well gone up to the D up above. I'm going to keep it lower since that is my bass part. Now let me get the metrical context figured out here. We're in 4-4, four, four, common time. So these will all be quarters. Now you could do you could do something else and make these dotted rhythms. That's fine. Fancy is okay too. But this works with a bunch of quarter notes. Okay, now we're going to write a melody up top to go with it. We want to think, all right, I want good counterpoint here, so I love thirds and sixths. I'm going to use them a lot. Um, if I use a, a perfect interval, I'm going to be careful with it. I'm going to make sure that I approach it by contrary motion. So let's pick a starting note. How about if I start here in my upper part? That's scale degree three. It'll fit this chord. Now, notice that. Before, if I didn't have a symbol, if I was just, say, I, would, I was just working with a bass line, I would have all these consonant intervals available to me in first species. Remember, first species is note against note, and it's all consonant all the time. So I would have a third above the bass as a potential note for some melody up top. I would have, of course, I've got this note too, a unison as possible. Third, fifth, six and the octave way up there. All those notes are potential. Maybe it would be easiest to think of them up here if we're writing up here. Now, all these notes are possible. Now once we do this though and say I want a one chord, I need to pick something that fits in G, D, D, uh, G major triad. And it just takes one note off the table. So in a way this just makes it a little bit easier because it, it restrains our choices. We can take this E off the table. We don't even have to think about it as a, as a possibility. But any one of these other notes would do. I'm picking that one out of the bunch. I'm picking B. Now, I always, I always like to figure out where I'm going before I do all the middle. So I'm going to jump to the end and talk about this cadence. I hope this is a review for everybody, but as we write these chords, we're going to have to be very careful about a couple of them. Um, one of them is scale degree 7. Scale degree 7 is, a, is called a tendency tone. It has a strong pull, a tendency to go in a particular direction. Once you've got a leading tone, you might as well resolve it in that next chord because it's going to have to move. It has to move up by half step to the tonic. So here's scale degree 7 resolving to one. Now, the Roman numerals and figures forced us to do that, 
but that's the principle, and we're going to have to do that in our part, even where the base doesn't force us to do it. Here's another situation where we're going to have to be very careful with our voice leading. So when we have, uh, in this case, four to three, the reason, see, scale degree four in, in and of itself doesn't have a strong pull to three. It can go up. It does a lot of times. You're used to it, like a four, five, one in the base at a cadence. That's we hear that all the time. So four up to five, that, that works too. It's not because of the scale degrees that four has to move down. It's because of its chord membership. We're in the context of a five chord, G, B, D, F. Wait, we're, <laughs> we're in G here. So I need, I need to think in, in G. Um, okay, so my five, seven chord is D, F sharp, A, C. C is the chordal seventh, and it's for that reason that it has to resolve down by step. The leading tone is scale degree seven. This is a, a number seven for another reason. It's the seventh of the chord. So seventh in the scale, seventh of the chord. Here we're talking about a reference point of G, and here we're referencing everything to a new spot, which is the root in this key. That in this context, that's a D. Okay, so seven's both, but seven for different reasons. Interval of a seventh from the, the tonic, seventh from the root of the chord. Okay, so we were going to move to the end here and make sure we resolve this appropriately. Okay, so we need to pick right off what kind of cadence we want. You know probably that if you're going to go five to one, you're either going to have a PAC or an IAC. In other words, a perfect authentic cadence which ends with scale degree one up top, or an imperfect authentic cadence which ends with scale degree three up top. We're not going to use scale degree five because that's very rare. And most people wouldn't even include that in the definition of an imperfect authentic cadence. It's sort of in the cracks. You could still say if your soprano, your top part were to end on five, you could still say authentic cadence. But you wouldn't say either of these two things, perfect or imperfect. Authentic just means that you're moving from dominant to tonic. But when you say perfect or imperfect authentic cadence, you're really talking about what the top voice does. OK, so we're writing our top voice. And if I want a perfect authentic cadence, I'll go here. I'll, I'll just settle on that. But I equally well could have, I could have written a B there. That would work too. Okay, so how do I want to approach this? Just like with our last exercise that had to do with counterpoint, we want to move by step at the end. That creates a sense of, of motion, of drive to the cadence. So we've got a couple possibilities. We could approach it from above, we could approach it from below. Leading tone up. Both are potential. I'll just sort of leave them there and see how we approach it and choose on that basis. Okay, so let's pop back to the beginning now and write in our, our upper voice melody. All right, so I just made the decision to start on E and see what that, uh, on B and see what that does for us. Okay. Well, I see a possibility here, if I do start on that B, of moving down to a G and creating a bunch of contrary motion. I mentioned we like lots of thirds and sixths. And we're going to get some by doing that. We're going to end up with a third and a sixth there. But we also want to consider the kind of motion. We mentioned perfect intervals and how we like to use contrary motion into them. But we like contrary motion in general because it makes the two parts independent from one another. They're each doing their own thing. This one, in this case, rising, and this one going down, descending. Now you see what that does. Remember what we call that? That's a voice exchange. These guys swap notes. This bass line and the soprano, they, sh they swap notes. And we can do a very typical thing with a voice exchange, which is fill it in by passing motion. So this is nice for a few reasons. We've got contrary motion, which keeps the two parts separate from one another. And we've got this really rich, beautiful sounding interval, third and the sixth, the imperfect intervals. We do have an, uh, an octave in between. 
but we're moving by contrary motion right through it. Okay, so that'll sound like this. Too bad our piano is an better tune. <laughs> but that's it. Okay, now we're going to make our way through another dominant to another tonic. Here we've done 5, 4, 3 to 1, 6. Here we're going to get the tension of a dominant resolving here to a downbeat. I want variety in this melody, so let's see if we can create some of that. I can't do this because that is already being done, and I don't want to double it. I don't want to destroy my counterpoint. So I'm going to avoid that. Now I could do something like this. But I feel a little bit sketchy about that because I'm, I'm really hovering around in this area a whole lot. I could pick another note here to get back to a note of the tonic. By the way, what, what makes this fast for me is that I'm thinking of this chord in terms of scale degrees. We listed out a moment ago when talking about inversions of dominant sevenths, the content of a 5-7. So if you've got all these notes in your mind, these scale degrees in your mind, when you think of a dominant seventh, it's easy to connect the dots, so to speak, between the different chords. So I'm thinking, okay, I want, maybe I, I want to get to a scale degree 3 here, which I know fits into this one chord. One chord is one, three, five, and create a, a nice interval, a third, that's great. I like I like thirds and six. Now I can do some note from this collection here. And I picked this, but didn't like it a whole lot because it seems like it's awfully repetitive. Moving through the same set of notes so much. And my new thought is, why don't I jump up here? I see that's scale degree four, and I know, hey, that's going to fit. That can work too. Now, if I do pick scale degree four here, I, I'm really stuck. I have to move to that B. And I think of them together. They're like a unit. When I write this note, that's going to follow. Why does that have to follow? Well, it's because of this. This note belongs to a dominant seventh and is the seventh of the chord, and chordal sevenths resolve down by step. That resolution has to happen. Okay, so now I'm going to be doing this in my top part. And I like that better than our previous. Snaps to sound like Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> So, okay, this sounds fresh and new to move there. Now, what do we want to do? Here's another dominant seventh. I'm thinking of these notes, five, seven, two, four, those scale degrees is all potential. What if I take this? I'm taking, all right, I'm going to use a two go down to a one in parallel motion. Now is that okay? Parallel motion potentially can ruin your counterpoint, but notice what interval we've got here and what interval we've got there. A load of imperfect intervals and that's that's nice. Okay, now how do I want to get into this? Think how that will sound. Or I kind of like getting down here because that sounds even more fresh and new since we haven't heard it before. Okay, so I'll do this. Here we got a third to an octave. Now that makes some pretty nice counterpoint. We've got a nice shape of coming up to one climax and then a lot of descending motion to get to the G. And yeah, it gets down to the leading tone and pulls up. There's our leading tone. Pulls up to the tonic at the end. We've got that octave to close it out. 
All right, let's listen to how that sounds, those two parts together. Again, if we had a good, nicely tuned piano, that would sound really good. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's a nice counterpoint. So first step I would suggest is take the Roman numerals and figures and make your bass line reflect them. That dictates, these, these symbols down here dictate what that must be. The only choices you have are what octave do you put those scale degrees, but you need those scale degrees. Second step is write a good counterpoint against that. Now that you've, you're doing exactly what you did before, when you did a counterpoint exercise, two voice counterpoint, first species, but you're, you're limited now because you have to fit the chord. You can't just pick a consonant note. You're restricted. You're restricted to these scale degrees if you've got some kind of dominant seventh, perhaps an inversion. You're limited to these notes, scale degrees one, three, and five, if you're dealing with a one or a one, six. So your hands are tied in a sense, but it only takes a few things off the table. And the way I like to think of it is, if you've taken some things off the table, then you don't have as many choices, and it's actually easier, in a sense. Then we write this, this tune up top. OK, so first of all, we write that bass using the symbols. Then we write a good counterpoint. And now we're going we're gonna to move on to filling in the inner voices. One other thing that we've had to address here is tendency tones that come up within dominant sevens. Uh, two things to remember. Scale degree 7 goes to 1. The chordal 7, which is scale degree 4, needs to resolve. And it goes down by step. That's its resolution. And the, the end result will be to get to scale degree 3. So let's go ahead and turn that into a emphatic. Scale degree 4 needs to go down to 3 when it's the chordal 7. Down by step. Now if you're in minor, that's not going to be a half step, but it's going to be a step. So remember it this way. The chordal 7 resolves down by step. One final thing. We're going to be creating a lot of authentic cadences, and those come in two varieties. If it's a PHC, perfect authentic cadence, you end up with that perfect interval, which is how it gets its name. It sounds very conclusive because you've got scale degree one in the uppermost part. You could also write an imperfect authentic cadence, IAC, and that has scale degree three up top. And notice that that creates, let's say we had it like so. If you had scale degree three here, you would end up with a third between the base and the uppermost part. That's an imperfect authentic cadence. Uh, because of the imperfect interval formed between those two notes. But eliminate from your consideration this note as an ending note. It's very rare. Stick with these two. All right, let's call it good for that, and then we'll fill in the inner parts.